So today it's it's not um, it's not part of a series. It's not part of a wider scheme of things in some ways. It's a one-off message that I really felt God wanted to share with us called Mind Skins. Are you ready for it though? Because I believe God wants to do something today. I believe God is doing something in us today. I I like to hum while I preach. Uh, (laughs) Are we okay? Slam task. Switch to the other one? Are we good? If I stand back here, if I don't move, if I, if I face this way, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. because I, I, don't, I don't want the devil or any other distractions to pull away from what we're about to talk about right now. Because I believe, I believe God is doing something in us. I believed it for a while now, but I believe today is, is a catalytic. Um, Sermon, I believe that it's just, I don't, I'm not saying it's a fancy sermon or a better sermon or anything like that. I just believe that some of the things that we're going to say, I believe God wants you to hear yeah. Yeah. for a reason, for now. Yeah. Not, not to put into practice in 10 years' time, for today. It's a word for today. Um, now, I'm, you'll have heard me use this illustration before. Okay, apologies, but it just fit really perfect. Um, so I was, I was there like, I was at Alton Towers like, Roughly a few weeks, maybe a month at the latest, after they opened Oblivion. Right? Anyone been on Oblivion? Yeah. The roller coaster, just a few. Okay. And, and I've been to Alton Towers beforehand, so I knew all of the rides, and, and there's all the usual talk. But no one had actually been and been on Oblivion, so I, I didn't know what to expect. I just knew it was a vertical drop. And, and so we went to Alton Towers and we planned when to go to Oblivion to try and get you know, the least amount of wait time in the queue. And so we went in the queue, but we had to queue two hours. And it was hot. And it was a, such a long queue, and my feet was aching by the end of it. And we're in this queue, and we're thinking, we're never going to get there. But at the same time, we're thinking, if I walk away now, I'm not going to get to go on the ride. So I wanted to stay for the ride. I wanted to go on the ride because it was new. And because it was exciting, and so it felt a little bit dangerous, a bit risky, a little bit... A little bit I, I was energised by it, and I thought, yeah, I want that ride, so I'm going to have to stay in the queue two hours and we were there not only two hours but the person that I brought with me to go on the ride was we'd, we'd taken some young people to Alton Towers and this young guy with me uh, he's not young anymore but he was young then and, uh, and he, he was with me and he said this he said Luke we got like literally we're almost at the front of the queue he goes Luke I need a toilet <laughs> I was like no <laughs> no you're not allowed to go to the toilet. So we, we've been queuing here now for an hour and 45 minutes. There's no way we're walking out of this, out of this uh, queue now so you can go to the toilet and start all over again. It's not happening. So we get to the end of the queue and we get buckled in. As we're getting buckled in, it starts to get exciting. And I start thinking, yes, yes, we finally made it. We're here, we finally made it. But we're not quite, it's not quite there yet. So if you know Oblivion, it's like a, a big massive drop, but you go up this thing first. And you go, you know, click, 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 click. As you go up... And you go up and you go round and then you go to the, the bit where you're about to go. So what on the way up? And I'm thinking at this point, I'm thinking, actually, I can't go back now. This is it. I'm in. There's no going back. I can't get out. I'm strapped in. I'm above the ground. The guy next to me is going, Luke, I really need a toilet. I'm going, no. I'm getting further and further up this thing. I'm getting and it goes around the bend. And then this is what the, this is what the ride does, right? It, it goes so far, gets to the end and it goes like that. And it just pauses there. And you watch it on the ground. And it's like that for a second. And then it goes. But when you're actually on the ride, it's like, is this ever going to end? Oh my goodness. And you're there and you, you can feel it's about to go. And you know it's about to go. And you're there and you're thinking, oh my goodness, can I even stay in this position for this long? You're hanging over and you're leaning onto the harness. And it feels like it could go any minute. And then out of nowhere, it just drops. And you shoot down the fence. The, the, the guy who I was with screamed. He was like, no! And I seriously thought that we would have left wetter than we were. <laughs> but we didn't. But there was this exhilaration. You know on those types of rides, when, you, when you're going through it, it's like it's, it's not in your stomach. It's like, it's so amazing. It's like it almost tickles. And it's so amazing, like, this is amazing, but I hope it stops soon. Because it's that kind of intensity. It was so full on. 
And, and I, I, I felt like God reminded me of that story and reminded me that we go through seasons like this in our life. We go through sometimes seasons where it feels as if we've been queuing for forever. That we've been waiting and we know there's something coming. We know there's something there in the future somewhere. We're not quite sure where. It feels like it's a million miles away and we're queuing and queuing and we're waiting and we're waiting and we're getting tired and it's uncomfortable and it's hot and my, your feet are aching and your friends complain about the toilet but you're waiting, you're waiting because you know the ride is coming. You know the thing is coming. Whatever that thing is, you know it's on the way. You know you're going to get there eventually if you just keep in the queue. And then you get to the ride and you get buckled in. And it's almost like you think, right, it's happening. It's coming. I, I can see it. It's, I can almost, it's just, just around the corner. I can see it. It's coming. You're going up slowly. And then you get right to the end. And sometimes God, he speaks to you and he's like, okay, it's about to happen. And I feel, church, that we are in that season where God's saying it's about to happen. That we've queued up and queued up and queued up, hoping, desperately hoping, getting tired, serving, trying to do what we know is right, keeping going, keeping, uh, keeping serving God, keeping believing, going, 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 going. We've got onto the ride in the last few months. I think we've gone it and we've gone up the hill. It's click, click, click and we know it's coming. And I feel that like right now, today, God's saying to us, we're, it's about to go. Yeah. We're about to go. Yeah. Can anyone else feel it? Yes. I feel it. It's like a tension in my belly, in my gut. God is saying he's about to do something powerful in this place. Yeah. And you feel it. In Amos 9, God is talking to the prophet Amos, to, to the Israelites. And he's prophesied all this stuff, all this stuff, but you're going to go into exile and all this stuff. He's, I think he's talking about the Assyrians and the exile that we read we did earlier about Ezra. And, and there comes this bit in, in, in Amos 9 where he starts to paint a different picture, where he starts as a but someday... It will change. It says this in verse 13 to verse 14. The days are coming, declares the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. Let me explain what this means. The person who's reaping is the person who's collecting in the harvest. They're the person who's going out and collecting all the food that's grown all the fruit. And it's saying that the person who lays down, who's, who's plowing the ground, ready for next year's harvest, they'll actually overtake the person who's bringing the harvest in because there's so much harvest to bring in that he's still harvesting when he should have finished. Yeah. That there's so much uh, fruit, so much harvest to come in that everyone else is catching up to the person who's got to bring it in. Yeah. That the person who's treading the grapes, that he will overtake the person, sorry, that he will be overtaken by the person who's planting next year's grapes. Yeah. Yeah. That the person has so much grapes to be crushed that he's still doing it when the next year's uh, grape harvest is being prepared. He says, a new wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills. And I will bring my people Israel back from exile and they will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. And they will plant vineyards and drink their wine. Now, I know wine is, I, I, just for a minute, just forget about the fact it's wine, okay? Okay, I'm not advocating people get drunk or anything like that. It's not, I mean, daft like that. What I'm saying is this. It represents something. It represents God's harvest for his people. And what I feel like God's saying to me, like I said, this is more of a prophetic message. This is talking about the Israelites and them coming out of captivity. But I'm telling you now, because I feel God's told me to tell you, that God has a harvest prepared for us. And it's so big that we won't be able to bring it in quick enough. I'm getting a response. Do you believe it? 
And I believe that God's been, he's been setting us up for this for a while. And even just this last season, we started at the beginning of the year looking at vision, refocusing on vision. What are we here for? Why, why are we doing what we're doing? And then we got excited about building the temple, building God's house. And then recently I, I've talked a bit about dealing with the attack of the devil. And the last time I spoke to you, I spoke to you about taking your authority. And last week, Ian Bird spoke about extraordinary prayer that will get, it will bring the miracle in. And I believe God's been setting us up. He's saying, get focused on the vision. He's saying, get excited about building my house. He's saying, don't let the devil rob you. Don't let him put it out. Don't let the fire be quenched. And he's saying, stand in your authority that I've given you and then pray like crazy because it's coming. It's coming. Matthew 9, verse 16 to 19. You'll know this verse well, probably. It says, no one sews a patch of unshrunken cloth on an old garment for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. In other words, when you get a new garment, new piece of clothing, it can stretch it's, it's, un, sorry, it's, it's unshrunk, sorry I should say, not stretch, it's unshrunk. But an old piece of cloth has already shrunk. Yeah. It's been through the wash, right? It's shrunken. And if you attach, if you patch up an old piece of cloth with a new bit of cloth, when the new bit of cloth comes to shrink, it's going to tear away and make it worse. So you don't put the new and the old together, yeah. right? It goes on to say this. Neither do people pour new wine in old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst. The wine will run out and the wine skins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wine skins and both are preserved. So there's there's a process. When the Israelites were making their wine, they would put their new wine in new wine skins. There's There's a fermentation process that continues. And what happens is then, in that new wine skin, that's new, so it has some giving it, some stretching it, the gases that would be released while the new wine is fermenting would fill that and cause it to stretch. But if you put new wine into an old wine skin that's already been stretched out, that's a little bit dry, a little bit old, it can't stretch. And so if you put new wine in, what literally would happen was, pop, it would burst. You can leave it for a while, but it would burst. And... This con- the context here of what Jesus is talking about is he's just been um, compared to the Pharisees' disciples. So the disciples of John the Baptist have come to him and they've said, how come the Pharisees' disciples, they're fasting, how come you're not fasting? So Jesus is being compared to the Pharisees, to the religious people, to the people that bring the law and the structure. And he's saying this, The stuff I'm bringing can't be contained by the old system, by the old wine skin. I'm bringing new wine. And when I bring new wine, I've got to put it in new wine skins. So don't compare me to the old way of doing things. Don't compare me to the old wine skins. Don't try and fit me in that box because I'll blow it wide open. Because I've come. I've come to give new wine. That new wine is his Holy Spirit. In church, we can cry out to God. Please, God, do something. Pour out your spirit. But God won't pour it out if we are old wineskins. You don't want to break us. The Holy Spirit cannot be poured out into a religious system or religious person. I believe God's patient with us. I believe he will wait and he'll work on us and create a new wineskin that he can pour into. But the good news this morning is this. God wants to do it. He wants to pour out his Holy Spirit, his new wine in us today. The new wine of joy. The new wine of freedom. The new wine of his Holy Spirit. And there's this bit in the Gospels that I never quite understood until recently. 
I'm 38 years old. I've read the Bible numerous, not numerous times, that's not really, you know, many, I've, a number of times. A reasonable number of times I've read the Bible, okay? All the way through. And I've read this story, and I thought it was just a nice story. A little add-on. See, look at what Jesus did. That was, that was fun, wasn't it? And it's a story of Jesus when he's at the wedding in Canaan. And we read in John 2, verse 10. In fact, I'll, just, I'll give you some context. Jesus has gone to a wedding, and, and he's been there, and they've drunk all the wine. They didn't bring enough wine in for the guests. And what you would do, obviously, is you put the nice stuff out first. Because people go, oh, that's nice. And then after a while, you start bringing out the cheaper stuff. Because people don't notice it so much when they've already had some wine, right? They're a little bit tipsy, and they have some the, the rubbish wine. And then the rubbish wine... Andy, can you just, just go sort those guys out outside? Cheers. And the, and the rubbish wine comes out last. And, and so, so this is the situation. They've run out of wine. Don't worry about them. They've run out of wine, right? And so they come to Jesus and, and say to Jesus, Hey, Jesus, what, what, what can you do for us? And he goes, Oh, no, 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 no. I don't, no, no, no. They don't want to do anything. No, come on. He says, No, come on, Jesus. We need a miracle. And so he, he, he gets some water in jars and he turns it into wine. And they taste it, and it's amazing wine. It's really good wine. Right? And this is what they said to him. In chapter 2 of John, and verse 10, it says, everyone, this is the guy now who's in charge of the wedding, talking to Jesus, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. You have saved the best till now. I thought that was just Jesus showing off. But as I read that this week, I thought God said this to me. I've saved the best till last. The greatest outpouring of God's Holy Spirit is to come on the earth. Not just in our church, in the earth. That God's, he's sent his wine before, but the greatest wine, the best wine is coming. And I believe God's got some better wine for us some better wine of his Holy Spirit to come in this place. So the question is, are we an old wineskin or are we ready for the next outpouring of God's Holy Spirit in this place? So I want to tell you what new wineskins look like. New wineskins look like hunger. You see, the old system, the way it used to be in, 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 in the Bible times, in, you know, in, in the pre-Jesus times, the old system was based on obligation. It was based upon rules. It was based upon doing what you were told you had to do. But the new system that Jesus brought in was based and thrives on a desire. Yeah. A desire to do what God wants. A desire to see God move. A desire for God. It comes out of a hunger, a zeal for his house, a zeal for God. It comes, new wineskins comes from people not interested in religion. It's going to take more than just showing up. It needs people who are desperate, desperate for an encounter with a real God, not a fake God, not one that's far away, but a God who actually speaks. A God who actually shows up. A God that keeps his promises. A God that heals. A God that actually sets free. It's time for us now to find a desperation for God. A desperation for something real. Do you believe it, church? That we can see a real God in this place. Because I believe when we see a real God in this place, when we all come hungry for a real God, to, see, to, to, to believe what the Bible tells us, it says that you can do greater things than these. When we become desperate for it, I believe God's going to pour out his new wine on us, his Holy Spirit. Psalm 37 verse 45 says, Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. Or another, another version says, and he will act. Yeah. I believe what follows our hunger is God yes. acting. Yes. 
God doing what he said he would do. We've got to get a hunger. We've got to get a hunger. I believe God's calling us now to get hungry. And what I believe then comes next, if we get hungry, I'm really hungry, for God, I believe what comes next is freedom. Freedom. Proverbs 10, sorry, Proverbs 3 verse 10 says this. Talking about an abundance, it says, vats will brim over with new wine. Your vats will brim over with new wine. In other words, the things that you store the wine in, God was saying to him, when you come to harvest, it'll be so much, it will run over the sides. Do you know what happens when you spill wine? It's messy, it's sticky, and it's colourful. And I think God's calling us to be a church that's messy. It's a little bit sticky sometimes. And it's colourful, full of life, full of joy, full of energy. This is a... This is where this church is heading. Life and life to the full. The old system was quiet and it was ordered and it was per perfect. But the new system will be loud and it's messy and it's full and it's perfectly imperfect. It's, it's where you can be yourself. And we're going to talk a bit more about freedom because there are boundaries to freedom. Freedom's not doing whatever. But God's calling a new sense of freedom here where we can be ourselves. We can worship him like he designed us to. Starts with hunger. But then moves to freedom. Isaiah 24 verse 7 to 9. It says, the new wine dries up and the vine withers. All the merrymakers groan. The joyful timbrels or tambourines are stilled. The noise of the revelers has stopped. The joyful harp is silent. No longer do they drink wine with a song. That's what happens when the new wine dries up. But in reverse of that, when the new wine comes, the merrymakers cheer. The music plays. Yeah. It gets noisy. Yeah. And there's worship. God wants to pour out his new wine. He wants to bring light in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. It starts with a hunger. It's going to lead, it's going to, lead to a freedom. And the last thing, this is where we're heading, church. The hunger and the freedom lead to revival. Yeah. And it says in Joshua 5 verse 9, just before the Israelites are about to go into the promised land and take it, they're on, the, they're on oblivion and they're hanging and they're looking down. They can see the promised land and they're about to go in. And God says this, today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt. And church, it's time. I feel God said that to me this week. He's rolling away the reproach of the past. He's rolling away the old system. He's rolling away the old way of doing things. He's rolling away the pain, the hurt, the past. And so we've got to shake off the cobwebs. We've got to stop making excuses. COVID, it's behind and the past is the past. And church, if you're watching this online now and you've not come back and you've got no reason why you shouldn't come back, I want to tell you, now's the time to come back. Shake off the cobwebs. If you're watching this in, in three weeks' time and you're new to us, I want to tell you, God wants you here. He wants you here with his people. And there's nothing wrong with online. If you need it, use it. Absolutely. I'm not complaining or dissing being online at all. But I'm telling you this, we've got to stop making excuses. Get to the house of God. Get around people who, who love you and who want to encourage you in your faith. Get around an atmosphere of faith because you will miss it. 
if you don't get here, you're going to miss it. So be it. Shake off the cobwebs. Get up because there's a real living God who wants to move. And I said this the other week and I'll say it again today. We are not waiting for revival anymore. We are starting one. Because that's what God's told us to do. And this is what, this is what God's new wine of revival looks like. The system will be broken. And people will flood to the house of God. And they'll find anointed worship that's flowing from the altar. And hearts that were broken will be made whole. And people will cry out to God and they will weep in his presence as they're exposed to his love. And the captives will be set free. And those in bondage to drugs and alcohol and porn and mental health issues will no longer be captive by them. And those who are broken and down heart and discouraged and depressed, they will rejoice in the freedom and the joy they're receiving from God and the excitement, people. The excitement because you haven't You won't have a clue what God's going to do next. That's what revival looks like. And that's what I believe we're heading towards as a church. Crutches and wheelchairs being left at the front as people are healed. I'm putting myself out on a limb here. But I believe it. I believe it's possible. I believe it's what God wants. And I believe if we come hungry and if we cast off and become freer in the way we worship God, I believe revival will come. And I can't wait. I can't wait. And this vat, I think it's going to brim. It's going to overflow. This is what I'm praying for right now. I'm praying that when we come to move upstairs, we'll be desperate for it. That we, we we can't contain any more people in this room. Because I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm done uh, uh, battling with the devil. I'm done allowing him to get in. I'm done. I'm done. Um, I'm done accepting anything less than life abundant. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm done being the devil's punch bag. Yeah. Are you? Yeah. In your life? In this church? Are we done being the devil's punch bag? If the devil wants to, to have a fight, he can get in the ring and stand toe-to-toe with us. Because we are moving forward. And we're heading for revival. Amen? Amen. I'm not sure you got it. But you're going to get it in the next few weeks, I promise you. You're going to get it. You're going to get there. I believe it. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray. Let's pray. Why don't you stand to your feet? Can we have the band up? Making you work hard today, Andy, sorry. I thought God said to me this week as I was preparing this, I thought God say that he is protecting this word. Never had that message before. I've, I've been, um, I've, I've preached messages where I felt so low, like the devil's just been attacking me and attacking me and attacking me. And I know it's because he didn't want me to preach what I was preaching, but today I felt God said to me, you're not going to feel that way. You're going to preach it because I'm, I, am, I am actually going to protect this word because it's, it's a birthing word. It's a birthing word. Like, I believe that us as a church, this is, we're pregnant. And we're in that stage now where it's the due date. And we're saying, how many more days? How many more days have I got to wait for this baby to come out? So God's protecting it. God, we want your new wine. We 
I want to pray for a heart connection right now. I pray for a heart connection, Lord. I pray you will take this word into our hearts, Lord. I pray, Father, for a seed of faith to be planted right now. I pray for the faith that calls it now. Not a faith that calls it one day. A faith that calls it now. Church, I believe that's for us. I believe God's calling you to have faith that can happen now. Not a faith that says, I'm believing it will happen. It's a faith that says, I'm believing it's happening now. Now. The word is now. I pray, Father, this will be a word that will germinate this week as we, as we go out into our... I pray, Father, you will remind people. I pray, Father, in their prayer times, Lord, you will begin to stir something up for this word, Lord. I pray, Lord, you will water it and you will water it every day, Lord, because I know that you're called this church to be a church of new wine, full of life, brimming to overflow. Messy, sticky church, but one that is led by you. Just every eye closed. Maybe you've never never given your life to Jesus you probably if that's you today probably thinking what is all this about this is crazy and it is it's a crazy message it's a message that it's not straight out of the Bible it's it's one that I feel God's given to me personally for this moment in time so it's a little bit different but isn't that how God should work and so right now God might be speaking to you might be calling you to him saying come back to me he might be starting to say to you you are my son you are my daughter And so God wants to call you into his family. He wants to get to know you. He wants to begin a relationship with you where he can show you his love, where he can give you his peace, where he can give you his joy, where he can give you his strength, that he can walk through life with you and that you can know without a shadow of a doubt that one day when you die, that you don't don't get cast away as someone who's rejected God, but instead you get to, to live on with him for eternity in his presence with, it, with that joy with that Holy Spirit with, with that peace and that passes all understanding you get to continue on forever in a place that we call heaven and I want to invite you to make a decision right now a choice to accept that invitation from God I've mentioned Alton Towers today when you go to Alton Towers, you have to pay for a ticket. We all have to pay for a ticket to get in. Some of us we might show up at Alton Towers and, we, and the ticket might be what? I don't know. 45 quid to get in. I don't know what it is now. But let's say it's 45 quid to get in Alton Towers. You can show up with £44.99p and not have enough to get in. Because it's not, and it's not, this is the thing. You're still going to go in whether you've got £44.99p or whether you've got 10p. You're still going to go in. But here's the cool thing. If someone comes along and says, I will, buy, I will pay for your ticket to get in all towers. It doesn't matter how much money you've got. They're paying the bill. And Jesus paid the bill so that you can have a ticket for heaven and a ticket into a relationship with God. All you have to do is accept it. Accept that payment. So I'm going to say a quick prayer. And if that's you, just please pray along with me. God, I'm accepting that ticket that you've paid for. That Jesus paid for with his own sacrifice. I'm accepting that. He's bought my way into heaven. He's bought my way back into relationship with you, Lord. That all the things, all the debt I had the spiritual debt, the the things I've done wrong that make me unable to come near you, unable to be in your presence, unable to get to know you because you are perfect, 
that Jesus has paid that debt off and you've allowed me to come and get to know you. You've allowed me to come and have assurance of eternal life. And so right now, I'm accepting that gift. Make yourself known to me. Make yourself real to me. From this moment on, in Jesus' name I ask. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, I want to invite you to come and let one of us know. Or just, why don't you let, if you're, if you're online, why don't you pop it in the chat or send us a message and we'd love to get in contact with you. Amen.